But at the end of the day, I had a dream, and that's to play professional football. That's always been my dream since I was a kid. And why stop now? You know, I was so close. Why stop now? And um, I felt like I, I owed it to myself. I owed it to my parents. I owed it to my family. I owed it to the city of Ottawa to keep going. Like, I could not quit. Like, that was never an option for me. Like, to quit and to just stop so short was just never an option. So just always having those daily reminders of what I'm doing. And I think one thing is important is regardless of whatever you're doing in life, as, uh, as long as you understand your why, that should serve as your motivation to get through anything. I understood why I was doing it, like why I was out here, why I was putting myself through this situation, why I was putting myself through these workouts is to ultimately achieve this goal. So just throughout that whole process, those 12 months, obviously, you know, you have your days where, you know, you're a little bit more down than usual, but being able to pick back up and fall back on, um, on, on, on what you believe in it and your why, I think that served as my motivation. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to my social life. This is the podcast where you can hear the life stories behind the people on social media. I'm your host, Jacob Kelly. As always, today's podcast is powered by TrueFan. Before we get into today's conversation with Patrice Renee, there's a couple things that we need to go over first. If you enjoyed today's podcast, be sure to leave us a positive rating and review. Share this episode with a friend, subscribe to the show. We have brand new interviews every single Monday and a brand new take takeaways episode as an audio exclusive where I sit down and break down the most recent podcast episode of the week every single Thursday. And now without further ado, I'm very excited to present to you my conversation with Patrice Renee. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to my social life. I'm your host, Jacob Kelly. As always, today's podcast is powered by TrueFan. Today on the show, we are joined by Patrice Renee. Patrice is an NCAA Division I athlete from Ottawa, Canada, playing for the Rutgers Scarlet Knights football team as a defensive back. Prior to that, he played over 40 games for the University of North Carolina and recorded over 100 tackles. With the recent changes to the NCAA's rules around name, image, and likeness, he has signed with the Ottawa-based sports agency Sportsman to represent him. I am very excited to have him here on the podcast today. Patrice, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm excited to have you here, man. Where I want to start, I want to go all the way back to the beginning. I like to start from from day one on this podcast. So correct me if I'm wrong, but you were born in Port-au-Prince, right? Yes, sir. I was actually born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Okay. And so, at what age did you did you move to Ottawa then? Yeah. So, um, so I was I moved to Ottawa. When I think I was about two two and a half years old. Very young. Um, my whole family, obviously from uh, Haiti, Port-au-Prince, youngest of five kids. My uh, mom and dad, and um, you know, at the time, right there, there was a lot of you know political turmoil in the country. Um, a lot of things, you know, weren't going too great, and uh, my parents felt like, you know, for the benefit of our family, for the benefit of everything we had going on, it'd be better off to try to seek out new opportunities. And uh, you know, they looked around. Um, we had a couple. I had a couple uncles and aunts. You know, my dad had a couple brothers sisters in the states, but they felt like Canada was the place to be, and that's where the place we would call home. So we decided to pack everything up and we moved when I was about two, two and a half. Okay. So talk to me about growing up in Ottawa then. I'm sure moving from Haiti, it must've been challenging for you growing up living here. So what was that like? Yeah, it was actually kind of interesting. I mean, for me personally, so, you know, getting to Ottawa when I was about two years old, like I pretty much was raised here, you know, was pretty much, you know, included through everything and, you know, grew up speaking English and French and all those type of things. But for my family members, I think it was a lot more difficult for them to adjust, um, especially for my older brothers and my older sister, you know, it's a, a huge culture change for them, a huge culture shock. Um, but I think at the end of the day, you know, we're a very close knit family, um, very tight, um, you know, a lot of love in the family, a lot of, you know, support and, you know, just working out and just uh, my parents are, I mean, they, they mean the world to me. They deserve all the flowers they could possibly get. Um, I've seen my parents work really, really hard to get to where we're at today and, you know, to put us through schooling, to put us through activities and, you know, being immigrants, you know, having to learn a different language, um, just having to learn a different way of life. It was definitely hard on them, but they were, you know, they, they, they made it through and uh, very grateful. And so you're the youngest of five, right? Yes, sir. Does yes, that sir. give you a little bit of like a, a competitive edge growing up, always being the youngest? Um, It has its perks, but it also has its downfalls a little bit. Um, Definitely could say I was spoiled. I'm not going to lie. You know, the youngest one always gets spoiled. And, um, but other than that, you know, I took a lot of beatings from my older brothers. Um, I took a lot of beatings from my older sister as well. Um, you know, I was left doing all the chores at the end when nobody else wanted to do it. Everything was just passed on from the oldest. It was like, all right, you'll do it, you do it. And I just ended up getting every, everything uh, on my plate. Um, but I mean, it's definitely cool. In terms of competitive edge, um, I think one thing I would say is just I always strive to be better than my siblings in a sense. You know, they always wanted me to be better than them. So my older brothers would always give me advice and I'd always be able to learn of what they did. You know, hey, I did this and that. I want you to not do it. I want you to be better than me. I want you to take this route. I want you to do this. So um, in terms of competitive edge, that was definitely one thing is just, you know, try to be better than what they did. And they've definitely helped me throughout the whole process, gave me great advice and always supported me throughout everything. 
And so you started playing soccer first, right? But then ended up switching over to football when you were around six. Yeah, yeah. So uh, being Haitian households, you know, we we don't know nothing about football back there. You know, our football is soccer. That's what we call football. So my dad, when he speaks of football, he's he's talking about soccer. So coming into Canada, what in our house it was always Brazil playing. Um, you know, for Brazil is his favorite team. Haitians, every Haitian household loves Brazil. So we watched a lot of Brazilian uh, t- soccer. Um, it was always on TV, and you know, I picked up a soccer ball. That was the first ball I ever picked up, dribbling around, running around the house outside. Um, so I wasn't really familiar with football until I was about six years old, and I got introduced to it uh, in a kind of unique way. And so one of your friends asked you to try for the East Ottawa Generals, right? Yeah, the East Ottawa Generals. So we were staying. Um, we we lived in Norristown, um, uh, in that area right now, and uh, we were. I was just outside playing around like a regular day, and um, they were just having football tryouts in one of the fields I was right by. So the field is about two, literally two minutes, two minutes from my house. Um, and it was just a lot of commotion, a lot of people signing up, and you know, me being the type of kid I was, like I just. All I wanted to do was go outside and play with the boys. Like all I wanted to do was just fool around outside. Like I never wanted to stay inside. I always wanted to, you know, play sports, ride bikes, you know, cops and robbers, you name it. I was doing it. As long as I was outside, it was cool. Uh, so one of my really good friends, he was like, hey, um, they're doing football tryouts. Maybe we should try to do it. Like, let's do it. So I'm like, man, I don't even know that. Whatever. Sign me up. So we get to the field, um, meet the coach, uh, Mark Quinn. Um, was actually one of the, you know, very, very, uh, very influential person, you know, because he started my journey at the football, you know, the whole football thing. So I met Coach Mark Quinn and he was like, yeah, you know, we could set you up for pads. And, you know, one thing about the East NY Generals that really is special, um, they give opportunities to any type of kid to go out there and, and play. Um, you know, football is definitely not a, a cheap sport. It, you know, it costs a lot of money to, you know, um, pay for equipment, pay for the different things. And they uh, allow inner city kids to have that opportunity to still participate without having the funds. So um, he uh, told me that, you know, I could sign up, I could play, get all the equipment. All I had to do was to sign this waiver. Um, so with the waiver, I'm like a kid. I'm like, all right, I'll be right back. Don't move. Don't go anywhere. Ran back to my uh, to my house. Went to go see my mom. I was like, yo, mom, listen, they're having football tryouts. Um, I really want to play. All my friends are about to do it. Could you just please sign the form? My poor mom, the poor little Haitian lady, I think she was cooking. She was like, what are you talking about football? Like, what is football? Like, you're already playing soccer. Like, what are you doing? I'm like, nah, this is American football. I'm just please, just please sign it. So after some convincing, she finally accepted it, read, the, read it over, um, signed the paper, gave it to me, sprinted my, I spread my butt back to the field, gave it to the coach. She's like, man, that was quick. I was like, yeah, I'm not playing. Like, I'm ready to just get started. Like, I'm, I'm serious about this. So I got my pads on, um, got me a set of pads, got me my helmets, and then we uh, started practice. And then when we started practice, took a lap. It was cool. My friends, my helmet was sticking out, huge helmet, way too big for my head at the time. Um, and then we started doing drills. And I remember one specific drill that, you know, I'll never forget was the Oklahoma drill. It's a classic football drill. You do it at every level. Um, you know, it's uh, uh, one of the most significant, I feel, um, crucial drills in every football player's, you know, career. Um, so lined up for Oklahoma drill. I was on defensive side of things. Uh, my boy was on offense. Coach blew the whistle, set hit. Got up and I got my butt ran over, like completely flat on my back. I'm like, damn, bro, like, ain't no way that just happened to me. Um, but instead of some feeling sorry for myself, I felt this rush of like, wow, like a drill in it that I've never felt before. Like, you know, soccer is, it's a pretty tough sport, but it's not as physical. You know, you're not out there hitting each other. So once I felt that hit, I was like, man, let me do it. It's my turn to hit you. Like, so let's run it up again. And from there, you know, I never looked back, you know, just fell in love with the game, fell in love with the sport. And it was just great. Why do you think that getting laid out like that was what made you want to do the sport more? Because especially for like kids, I feel like if a kid gets smoked in front of everyone at a football tryout, that's going to discourage them from from doing it, but it encouraged you. So what was it about that that really made you want to keep going? Really, for me, honestly, it's just my competitive edge. Like, I'm a competitor. Like, I love to compete in anything I do. Like, whatever it is, I hate to lose. Um, I don't like losing. I don't take losing seriously. Um, I mean, lightly. And so, you know, when it happened to me, I was like, man, like, the only thing I knew what to do was to line up again and not let it happen. So, uh, for me, it's just just being a competitor. Um, it's always been in me, um, you know, whether we're playing Monopoly, whether we're playing, you know, um, we're just walking to school. I got to get there first. I got to do first. So, it was always about winning and just being a competitive guy. And so, at what point did you realize that, like, football is what you want to do as a job like was it right away was that first trial was it a couple of years in like at what point did you realize you know what i want to do this so um really at first it was very just straight for fun like it was just something i wanted to do hang out with the boys i never really thought much of it um, i used to watch football on tv um you know watch the nfl cfl games but i never really saw myself being there for me um i was just having fun and then it wasn't until I was about in seventh grade, around seventh to eighth grade. Um, I had a game, I had a really big game. Um, I played quarterback at the time, um, had a really, really good game. And then I was coming off the field and then I was approached by this man named Victor Tondondo. 
And uh, Victor Dodano, he's my mentor now, my big brother, and I owe him everything, you know, for for, for where I am today. But um, he's a prominent figure in the city, and he's uh, he runs a, a training academy called Green Iron Academy. And uh, he approached me after the game. He was like, "Hey, man, my name is Victor Tordando, um, and you know, I'm a I'm a trainer here in the city. And you know, what I do is, you know, um, I seek out the talent, and with guys that I think have quite potential." Uh, potential to make it to the next level. I want to help them out in any way possible. And he really um, decided, it was like, hey, I would like to talk to you. Let's set up a meeting and we'll talk about your future. So I ended up setting up a meeting with Vic um, and we sat down and he was telling me, yo, he really believes that I have potential to become something greater. And if I'm willing to put in the work, if I'm willing to put it right, if I really want it, I have a chance to play professional football one day. Um, I have the chance to go to NCAA and get my school paid for, um, go to a big time school um, on a full ride scholarship, get my degree. So all of these things I would put in perspective, I was like, whoa, like, I could really do this. I always knew I was good, but that's when after meeting with Vic, I was like, all right, this is something I could really do. So let's lock in. Um, and then from that point on, I started training five days a week, um, either weekend, we would go out, take trips, um, you know, go to showcases and stuff like that. And once I started doing those things, getting recognition and keep balling and the hype starting to grow, I was like, all right, this is something that I could really do. This is something I love to do. And, you know, at the end of the day, if you're going to tell me I get paid a certain amount of money to catch a ball and play around with my boys. I'm going to take that any day. So um, definitely, definitely, that's when I knew I could do this as a job. I want to call back one thing you said earlier, though. You said football is obviously not a, not a cheap sport to play. So talk to me about kind of the sacrifices your parents and your family had to make to allow you to kind of pursue these opportunities. I read somewhere, I think your dad was working three jobs at a time at one point to help you like get cleats and stuff like that. So talk to me about the sacrifice and the commitment your family showed to you to help you chase this dream. Yeah, most definitely. So, I mean, that's one thing I'm very grateful to, is to have two parents, a two parent household and parents that are loving, but most importantly, supporting, like with everything that we wanted to do as kids, they really, really tried to support us, whether that's, you know, arts, sports, music, anything that we had interest in, they were always back there to support us. So once I, they realized that I know I wanted to play football and that's something I really wanted to do. And, you know, I genuinely enjoyed it and, you know, kept me out of trouble. Um, you know, they did everything they possibly could to make it happen, whether that's, you know, picking up extra shifts, picking up an extra job. You know, my dad, um, you know, he started doing cleanup jobs, construction jobs, any odd jobs he could do. Um, my mom, you know, she worked two jobs. She worked as a secretary and as a cleaner, uh, cleaning lady as well. Um, and just seeing them work, you know, um, you know, I remember uh, one time, you know, there's these pair of cleats I really wanted from Sports Check, from, uh, but my, pop, my pops, he couldn't afford them at the time. And I had to go get the Walmart cleats. And I was like, man, like, damn, I can't get the Nike cleats I wanted. I had to wear these second cleats. And then my dad, he like the, the look that I saw, like him seeing me being disappointed, but I was never at all brat about it. I understood, but he obviously knew like I wanted. And then he ended up um, going over shit. Like he was working overtime all week. And I was like, why are you working overtime? Like what's going on? And then like about after that week, the next day he came back home with the box, the Nike box, and he got me those cleats. And I was like, wow, like that really touched me. And I was like, like he really believes in me. He really supports me. Um, so um, looking back, it's, it, I can't really say enough about my parents and all the sacrifices they've done. Um, and obviously, like, you know, um, one thing that's special, too, like I mentioned, you know, the East Ottawa Generals giving guys opportunity to, you know, have different, you know, ways of managing, you know, the cost, um, whether that's, you know, financing or whether it may be help from uh, somebody else. They always made it doable. And, you know, my parents were very communicative about our situation and what we had going on. And we're always able to get help from, you know, where we needed it. So um, just them, big shout out to my mom and dad for doing all, all, all they've done for me. And, and the quote from the article that I read about you, you talked about that story briefly in the article, how your dad worked two or three jobs at, over time. There's a quote here that said he, he just kept grinding and never complained. Talk to me about the fact that he never complained. Cause I think that's so important to that whole thing. You know, it'd be, I think it'd be completely different if he's working overtime and complaining to you the entire time that he's working on this overtime to get you shoes, but he never once said anything about it. So talk to me about how important that is for you and growing up to hear your parents never complain about all this extra work. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, especially in our culture, the Haitian culture and our story, how we, how we came up and moving, um, working is everything they knew. You know, my parents, all they knew to do is work. You know, um, they always taught me to get whatever you want in life. Nothing's going to be given to you. You got to work. And obviously my dad, you know, he made me understand at an early age that life is not going to be easy. Um, there's a lot of, you know, constraints. There's a lot of variables that's going to make it difficult for me to grow up, you know, in a certain area, in a certain setting. Um, but he always told me as long as you're an upstanding man, respectful man, and you work hard, you know, you'll be fine. And um, that's something that I saw growing up every day. Um, you know, just wake up early in the morning, go to work, come back late at night, go to work and never complain. He always was grateful for what he had, um, always made do. Um, and even if I wasn't able to get everything I wanted, he always made me understand that, you know, there was a reason behind it, that it wasn't the end of the world. I could manage without it. Like a lot of the things are materialistic, of, of course, but, you know, at the end of the day, as long as we stand on our values and what we believe in and we're good 
good people will be just fine. So he never, and he was, uh, 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 we're very religious as well. Um, very spiritual, uh, very spiritual family. And God is something, uh, uh, is, is, is a figure that is very prominent in our family. And, um, um, in that sense, prayer has always been a, a big staple in his life. And he's always felt like, you know, with God in his life and being able to rely on him, he'll be fine. And he felt grateful for all the opportunities coming in from Haiti. And now he's in Canada, um, being able to send the kids to a good school, being able to have a better life. I think for him, it was just more so like, I can't complain. I've come so long. Why am I supposed to complain now? You know, life is good. Life is where it's supposed to be. It might not always be easy, but at the end of the day, I'm, there's no reason for me to complain. There's always somebody that might have a tougher situation than where you are now. So just to always keep your head down and just keep grinding. And I think that really, really served me a lot throughout my whole entire life. Yeah, it's about, because life's always going to have adversity, but he would say it was always about how you react to it, how you respond to it, right? Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, that's for sure. That's one thing that he would tell me. And one of my football coaches, Larry Fedora, he would always tell us too, um, you know, adversity's coming. Adversity is always going to be there. Um, what's important is either you're going to let it choke the shit out of you, or you're going to grab it by the neck and choke the shit out of it. So I think that you know that quote is also something that will always stay in my head forever. Like adversity's coming, but it's rather how you react to it. You could let it either beat you down, or you know, hey, stand up. It is what it is. Dig your feet in the ground and attack the situation, whatever it may be. And so, talk to me about the first time you ever spoke to an NCAA coach. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it, was it Rutgers? Was it Bob Fraser who came to visit you? Was that the first NCAA coach you ever spoke to? He was one of the first. Um, I think the first NCAA coach I ever spoke to was um, actually Bowling Green University. It was one of the camps we went to. I was very young. Um, it was in Ohio, uh, and, and uh, I believe it was Ohio. But we went out there for a camp, and um, you know, just talked to them, and uh, it, was, it was special. But I think what we did was so every weekend we'd take in the academy, we would pack up a van, like a seven seater van pack up, I think it was like six athletes and be him driving. And they would go to different little showcases. And then each showcase, they'd have like college coaches there and, you know, just trying to see kids. But there'd be like thousands of kids at every camp. Um, and all you try to do is get your attention. And what Vic used to do, like, he used to be like a pest, like a, like a dog, literally going to every coach, like, hey, I got these guys from Canada. Like, you guys should do like him. Like, hey, hey, hey. Like, he used to go to every coach. And I think at one point, coaches just got tired of him. And he just made a name for himself for being known as the guy that would go to camps and would be like, I got these Canadian guys right here that are a special talent. Like, please look at him i think you know coaches start being like all right let's actually take a look at these guys like what he's about this canadian guy they're driving six seven eight maybe ten hours even sometimes to come out to this to this camp and see what they're about um but yeah that was kind of like the first uh, uh coach i really talked to was bowling green and i think i was about what like seventh grade maybe so yeah so like 12 or 13 then yeah i'm yeah, deaf. that's crazy like, i can't like how do you handle that like the men like mentally how do you handle that as a 12 13 year old knowing that what's happening on the football field now could impact you your future so drastically. Like I can't, like when I was 12, 13 playing sports, I was playing in volleyball in front of like 13 people. So like, how do you handle that mentally as a 12, 13 year old when you have all these coaches and scouts looking at you, evaluating your performance so critically, so young? Yeah, I think one thing that's, that's important, that was important for me is just my support system, you know, my surrounding cast. I mean, I, you know, I mentioned Victor, um, he played a major role in my parents and my, my peers, but one thing that made it easy for me um, is the main thing has always been the main thing, and that's football, and that's playing. Like, I was always told to just focus on playing, like focus on doing your thing, focus on performing, have fun with it, and the rest will take care of itself. And that's kind of always been my mindset throughout the whole process is just, at the end of the day, I know if I go out there and I take take care of my job, like, I don't have to worry about anything else. Everything's going to folk, you know, everything's going to fall into place. Coaches are going to find you. I don't have to go above and beyond to go be looked at, you know. Um, you know, people are going to want to see me at that point. As long as I'm balling and doing, taking care of the game, um, you know, everything will fall into place. So that's, that having that mindset when I used to go to the camps, I knew coaches were watching, but I was like, they're going to come talk to me if I ball out, right? If I perform, they're going to come talk to me. They're going to, they're going to come seek out, seek me out. So all I ever did was just grind, grind and just focus on my craft. And, you know, I didn't really have to worry about everything else. And I think that's something that was very important. I think, you know, that's the advice I'd give out to kids nowadays that are, you know, trying to get through that process. Everything will happen, you know, everything will fall into place for you. As long as you keep the main thing, the main thing and that's playing and that's performing. Um, and at the end of the day, that's all thing I could say. That's everything I did. Just keep my head down and focus on what I had to do. And then everything worked out. So your first two years of high school, you played St. Pete's and Orleans Bengals, right? Mm-hmm. I actually started off uh, funny at Garneau High School. Um, and they had a football team there for a little bit, but the, they ended up having to cancel the team that fell through. Um, and I wanted to continue playing high school ball. And, you know, by the works of, you know, some behind the scenes magic, um, I was able to attend St. Pete's, um, you know, don't really go into that, into, into depth with that, but I was able to make that transfer happen and join their football team and play there. So it was kind of, that's, that, was, that was sweet. And but sorry, the St. Pete's and the Orleans Bengals, are those seasons running 
at the same time. So are you having to go from like one practice to the other and play two games a week and stuff like that? Um, the main seasons are not like always at the same time, but they definitely overlap at a certain point. I remember I'd have maybe like two practices in one day sometimes, um, but it was like for a short period. I think uh, for the Bengals and the CAFA situation, it's definitely a summer league. Um, most of our games are in the summertime, um, you know, uh, compared to the fall, compared like, to the schools here. So uh, it was it was never like it never became to a point where it was too stressful for me to handle. Um, they definitely overlapped at a certain point, but it was it was always smooth. And talk to me about kind of the the skill level in Ottawa. Do you think there's a crop of players here that just aren't that are underrated coming out of the six one three? Most definitely, most definitely. And I think, you know, you see it, I mean, already throughout their academy as well, just just Gridiron Academy itself. Um, we have, I think, at least a minimum of ten guys that are playing division one ball right now, um, at at a, at a high level, um, you know, in power five conferences. Um, all come from Ottawa, Ontario. Um, you know, we have Neville Gallimore, who's playing for the Dallas Cowboys right now. Eli Anku, who plays for the Buffalo Bills. And these are all guys that come from literally Ottawa, Ontario, like down the street. Like I grew up with them, playing ball with them. So I definitely think, you know, one thing, the lack of talent was never a thing. There was always talent. It was just the lack of exposure. I think that's the main thing that we got to focus on is to find a way to bring eyes to these ta- to these athletes, bring eyes to these players that are there. Because, I mean, we've had talent, like we're able to play. And it's funny because, you know, in the States, like every time we would go, I would be like, oh, yeah, we're Canadian athletes. We're Canadian players from Ottawa, Ontario. They'd be like, who, where, what? Like they would not even respect it. And they wouldn't, but they just, they had no idea until we would go to those camps and get the exposure ourselves. We would drive down 12, 15 hours and put ourselves in front of the, the platforms, put ourselves in front of the TV, put ourselves in front of those media, those, those um, you know, um, outlets that would actually promote us. So I think, you know, the talent has always been there. And we have a whole bunch of other guys now that I know that are up and coming in the city that are still trying to go through that process um, that are going there. So the talent is always there. And I'm very, very proud of it. And, uh, you know, I'll ride or die and say, we have some of the best ball, not only, you know, in the city, in the city, but like in the country, like I think Ottawa is, is the hub for, for, for elite athletes for sure. And so as someone who's gone through that whole experience of having to go to all those showcases every week and driving those 12, 15 hours, what do we have to do for that, that tide to turn where instead of us going to them, they're starting to come to Ottawa because they know there's just so much talent here. Yeah. I think, um, it's starting to, to pick up that ball starting to roll a little bit where you have coaches starting to take visits. I remember when I was going through the process, you know, Rutgers, you know, it was one of the first schools to actually take a flight and come watch me at uh, perform at the Dome. Um, then after that, North Carolina came, Wisconsin came, um, and those schools started, the ball starting to roll. And I think what we're doing, especially, you know, going again, I know I, I know I mentioned him a lot, but Victor and what he's doing with the Green Eye Academy is something very unique and special and just creating that, you know, that outlet for the, the athletes to come through and just, you know, have that place where guys could come and coaches could know a rep like a reputable place that's you know legit not only just here or say but that's actually has proof in the pudding and that's renowned and known and they could come up and see but um i think it's just you know guys um you know being prideful i think also not trying to sugarcoat anything or just being prideful from where they are you know being you know wherever i'm at whatever level i know i'm always relating back to ottawa ontario that's home for me and just to you know always say like that's i'm a product of my environment i'm a product of ottawa ontario like that's where i grew up that's where i was made and that's how i became who I am today. So I think just always, you know, representing where you are, representing where you're from and just giving that value is also going to help wherever, you know, you end up being. So um, things like, you know, academies like Gridiron Academy um, and just uh, meet uh, social media as well. Um, just using those type of tools, I think it's just any way you could get eyes to a person and putting them in front of the world to see is going to be beneficial to the cause. And so for, with having that much love for the city, was it hard for you to move away at 15 and move to Virginia? Oh, that was one of the hardest decisions I've ever had to make in my life. Um, you know, growing up, I mean, I'm a very, you know, friendly, friendly guy. Like I love my relationships with my friends, my family. Um, very, very grounded person in that sense. Um, but for me, it was just more so of a decision, like what I really want to do in life. Like, is this something that I really want to pursue? I really had to find and do a lot of soul searching, a lot of sitting down with my parents. And um, once again, going back to them, just talking to me and being like, hey, listen, I know that you love the sport. I know that you love this. And we believe that you doing this and that will put you up in a position to achieve your goals. If that's what you want to do, let's do it. If that's the sacrifice you want to make, let's make it. Um, so that at the end of the day, it all comes back to the love of the game. Like, that's what it falls back to. I just love this game so much. And to be able to play it in a professional level, I was like, this is what I have to do. I'm going to do it regardless of what I have to do to make it to achieve my dream. I wasn't looking back. So it was definitely a hard decision, but I knew it was for the better. I knew it was necessary and um, I was able to make it. But just leaving my friends, leaving my boys behind, I mean, it was always tough because we used to have the best times, man. When I tell you, like, 
we had the best times. Um, and we, but at the end of the day, like when we moved, when I moved and went down south, we'd always communicate every day. Um, you know, every time was another day planning on, or when I get back in the city, what we're gonna do. You know, what we're gonna, uh, what are we gonna go? What we're gonna do when we come back? So um, it was definitely tough, but it was a decision that was necessary for sure. And so that school was at Episcopal High School. Yeah, Episcopal High School. Everybody has always has a hard time saying it, but yeah, it's Episcopal High School. Yes, sir. Yeah, and so you spent two seasons there, right? Yeah, my junior senior year of high school. And your senior year, you balled out. You were team captain, MVP. I think you were playing DB receiver and were returning kickoffs, right? You were all over the field that senior season. Yeah, I, I barely, uh, I don't think I ever got off the field from the first whistle to the last. So um, definitely got my, got my work in throughout my senior year. Yeah, and so I got some of the accolades here from that senior year. So you were named uh, first team VISAA Division One All State as a senior, uh, 2014 CBS All American selection, second team All Met honors from the Washington Post. Um, and during this time, I'm assuming recruiting is really picking up. I have here as well. Rivals ranked you as number seven player coming out of Virginia, 22 safety in the country, ESPN number nine in Virginia, 25 corner in the country. Um, how are you handling the pressure at that point? Because obviously it's one thing when your kid growing up is trying to talk to these schools, but as you get closer and closer to college now, people are starting to recognize you. Every game now, you know, there's a certain standard you have to upkeep. So how do you handle the pressure at that point? Um, really the main thing I could say on that is confidence. I think as any athlete or anybody, whatever you're doing, you need to have confidence. I'm not necessarily saying like confidence, but just confidence in yourself, confidence in your skill. And um, I think that's something I, I don't lack of. You know, I'm very confident in myself and confident in my abilities. And, you know, at the end of the day, when I step on that field, I know it's time to go. I feel, I honestly genuinely feel like I'm the best out there. Like, it's time for me to do my thing. And I think that's always been made it, you know, easier for me to just take that pressure off, just to just to have confidence. And I think especially at the corner position is one of the toughest positions to play where you're not going to win every rep. You're not going to, you know, win every jump ball. You're going to get beat. Somebody's going to catch a ball on you. But what's important is how, again, going to how are you going to react to it? Like, I can't allow that one play to mess me up for the rest of the game. I got to be, okay, you know what? It happened. You got it. But I know what I'm able to do. I put confidence in my training. And, like, that goes back to all the work I've put in throughout the years, all the countless hours in the gym, all the countless sacrifices instead of going out on a Friday night with my with my friends. Now I'm out here getting extra reps in at the gym. I'm out here doing more things, more extra sprints in the morning doing, and all these things is really what helps build that confidence. It's not just arrogance. It's just now I know I've worked so hard all throughout these years to be able to be where I am today that it, that's the way it has to go. So for me, um, confidence is definitely a big key that's helped me out. Um, just going out there knowing that, you know, I could rely on my abilities and just go out there and ball and, you know, whatever happens, happens. But at the end of the day, I know I'm, what I'm going to be able to do and, you know, um, just let make it happen. I like that. I like that difference between confidence and arrogance where confidence is backed by the work versus arrogance is backed up by nothing. Um, yeah. But talk to me about um, Coach Panos Vulgaris. How did he help you develop both as an individual and as an athlete? Coach Valgaris, that is my guy, like ride or die, like peanut butter jelly, man. Um, so it's actually interesting. So once uh once uh we, we sat down, my family and I and Vic, we sat down to to figure out what was gonna go on. Um, we had to find a new home for me. So the idea was I got to end up going down south to finish my high school career because the college coaches were saying, you know, being Canadian football, different rules, different mechanics, different everything. They wanted to see if I was able to compete against their highest competition down south, how would I play against American kids and this and that. So I knew I always, you know, we knew I had to find a new home. So in that process, trying to find a new home, um, um, Vic was going around, shopping around, trying to see, you know, different tools. And, you know, being an international student, we had to find a situation where I'd have somewhere to live, whether it was a host family, a campus, whatever it may be. We're just trying to find the best of both worlds. And through his searches, I guess, you know, reaching out to different coaches and his connects, um, he ended up getting in touch with Coach Valgaris. And Coach Valgaris, um, you know, he was the head coach at Episcopal High School, which is a very prestigious school, great school, great academics, very renowned um, in the area. You know, one of the top boarding schools in the nation, um, as well as a great, great football program. So he reached out to Vic and they got together. And uh, all, all Valgaris wanted to do is like he wanted to arrange a meeting. So he was like, he's going to fly up to Ottawa, Ontario, sit with my parents and just pitch me, you know, come to my school. This is what I should do. So he came up here in January on a cold, cold, cold winter day. And he was like, man, like, this is crazy. I feel like this is where you live at. Like what? Um, but he, you know, for me to see that, I was like, wow, he really has interest. Like he really wants me to go to his school. So we sat down together um, and he pitched me. And um, at the end of the day, he fell back a great academics and great football program. Um, and uh, he really took me in at the age of 15 as one of his kids, um, as, 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 a, as a son, like he really, you know, gave me everything I needed, was always there to support me. And at the end of the day, like 
athletes and coaches always have, you know, a very specific, different relationship. And I think our relationship was able to go throughout the years and just being somebody that I could rely to, being my parents away from home, um, it was just a, a, a great, 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 great situation for me. And um, I, I love Coach Valgaris to death. And he, he's taught me a lot about the game, a lot about myself, um, just in terms of to continue to be disciplined, to stay in, locked into my vision, um, keep working hard. And, um, yeah, we had a lot of success together. And um, I was glad I was able to, you know, come across him throughout my career. And he's he's since come back to Ottawa, right? Like a number of guys from the city have now gone to play at that high school as well after oh, you? Yeah, so- so after I went, so um, it was actually me and my boy, Jonathan Sutherland, who actually plays for Penn State right now. He's uh, over there uh, finishing up his career at uh, Penn State. But it was us two coming up through the academy. Um, and he said he had a meeting with uh, Coach Paul Garrison as well. And we went. And, you know, after our first year there and all the success we had and, you know, just once again, like the, the, the prestigious of the school, the opportunity that was there, uh, we ended up kind of creating a little pipeline. So um, after we were there after the first year, we had – uh, Luigi and Chris Forney come back and we started having a couple guys go through the system and um, it's benefited us very well. It was a very great mutual relationship where, you know, we were able to go there and perform and help the school out and have a great time as well as receiving uh, A1 education um, and things like that. But um, unfortunately, you know, Coach Walgaris, he ended up moving on, uh, moving back home to Boston where he's at now. And, uh, you know, I'm still close with the school and the universities, but they had a coaching change in that sense. Um, but it's still de- definitely, definitely a special relationship over there. And so when did recruitment start happening? If you obviously you started on 12, 13s when you're talking to those first coaches, but when did you get your first official offer? So I got my first official offer. Um, when was this? Probably like eighth grade, ninth, uh, summer eighth grade going into ninth grade. Um, I got my first offer from Akron University. I went to a camp called Sound, Mouse, Sound Mind, Sound Body, which is one of, it's an annual camp that's uh, held in Detroit, uh, Michigan. Um, and it's one of the bigger camps in the, in, in the country where there'll be over 300 college coaches there and over about 2,000 kids going there. Um, and um, just was at the camp, was performing. Um, I was, you know, at the younger age, I was like in the, I mean, the, the younger kids, obviously, um, but I was dominating the kids that were my age and my class, age group. And then they, you know, the guy, type of guy he is, he was, I was like, all right, man, you're, like, we're not going to keep, man, you play against these guys. You're going to go in the bigger, bigger kid area, um, bigger kid group. So I ended up made my way through the older group um, and then started making reps and getting reps with the older guys. And I was, you know, still performing. I was, I was doing well with the older guys. And I was like, Yo, who's this kid? Like, who's this guy? And they were like, oh, yeah, he's this young Canadian kid, um, eighth grader from Canada. I was like, what, eighth grader from Canada? Um, and then from that point on, um, Akron, they tried to jump on ship early. They saw me early and they're like, we're going to offer this kid before, you know, he gets, he gets, he gets, he blows up. Um, so I always have a special, special space in my heart for Akron, a university of Akron Zips. They were my first official offer and it was kind of pretty sweet. And so how many offers in total did you end up getting? Uh, when it was all said and done, I had definitely over 40 offers from different schools. So you know, could have went anywhere, honestly. And so what are you, when you're evaluating all these different schools and all these different offers, what are you looking at out of a program that makes you want to go there? Um, one of the main things is just um, familiarity. Like I always try to tell people like a lot of kids want to talk about coaches, want to talk about, you know, things like that. But in reality, in the football world, coaches change, coaching staff has changed. People get fired, people get hired, people get promoted, people get demoted. It's that it's not really a stable you know, thing to look at. So for me, um, the advice that I was giving from my peers and older guys like Eli, Michael O'Connor that had gone through the process before me is to go to a school where you feel comfortable going. Let's say football wasn't there, would you still be happy there? Like, is it somewhere that you would be, you know, fine just attending as a regular student? Um, so definitely that's some one of the main things I was looking for when I was going around is would I just be happy? Let's say football was taken to me today. This is going to be a place where I feel comfortable at. Um, and then other than that, obviously, then you go into the coaching staff, to the schemes, to the players, um, to the atmosphere, um, campus, you know, uh, you know, um, uh, student body, um, school spirit, this and that. But I think for me, the main thing was just familiarity and it, if I felt comfortable being there without having football being there. So um, that's kind of one of the main things I looked at throughout my process. Okay. And like you said, like you mentioned, you could have gone anywhere. Like some of the schools that offer you Penn State, Ohio State, Rutgers, Tennessee, Nebraska, Cal, amongst many others. And I believe Ohio State offered you a couple of years later at that same Sound Mind and Body Camp, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, most definitely. Yep, they did. And so you narrowed it down then to Ohio State and Rutgers originally. Those are the original two, the final two. You ended up picking Rutgers initially. So what led to that original commitment to Rutgers back in 2015? So my original with Rutgers, um, once I went there and I went on campus, I took a visit, I fell in love with the place. Um, I fell in love with the area. I fell in love with the campus. They had a beautiful campus. 
Um, you know, the, the, the students were showing me love, um, shouting my name when I was walking around. Like, I just felt at home. Um, and the coaches were great. Coach Flood at the time, he was there. He made me feel very at home. Um, you know, I mentioned Coach Frazier. He came, had came to Canada to come see me play. So I had a really good relationship with the coaching staff. Um, I really felt like it was a place where, you know, I was familiar with. And then um, one of the major things for me was my grandmother being so close. Um, she lived in Brooklyn. Um, she still lives there right now, uh, which is only like about a 45 minute drive to where I'm at. So having my grandmother being close to me, my cousins and family, um, it just made it even feel more at home. Um, not too far from, you know, Ottawa, Ontario. It's about a six hour drive. So, you know, very accessible for my parents if they wanted to come or if any of my friends wanted to come out to games. Um, you know, I just felt like, you know, it was home for me. I could go out there and make my career and, you know, make make a name for myself over there. So uh, it's more of the more things too. Um, it was a gut feeling there too. Like, you know, once I stepped, I was like, wow, like I could see myself in that Scarlet Knight balling out. And in, uh, I think it was High Point Solution Stadium at the time it was called. And I just saw myself, you know, like making plays and, you know, getting the band excited. It just felt like home for me. But ultimately there was a coaching change and that led to you decommitting, right? Yeah. So um, unfortunately, you know, I was I was one of their top commits and well, committed early. Um, but there was a situation that had happened where the coaching staff got let go um, and they were, you know, they didn't have a coach for a while. So I was still committed at the time. I tried to stay committed for as long as I could. Um, but, you know, just trying to figure out what was going to happen. So throughout that process, obviously, you know, I opened my recruitment up in the sense where I was listening to coaches, you know, coaches that were interested, is uh, still interested to, you know, have me on the team. Um, I was, you know, taking calls, taking visits, just trying to, you know, make sure, you know, I, I make a right decision. And uh, it was kind of funny because one of the like, Ohio State you mentioned was uh, my final two. Um, they were recruiting me really hard. And the coach that was at the time, the defense coordinator was Chris Ash, Coach Ash. And he was, you know, recruiting me hard at Ohio State. Um, but just I mentioned, like, the, the, the football world is so crazy and unpredictable. He ended up taking the head coaching job at Rutgers. That's why he was recruiting me. He was like, wait, hold on. Um, change of plans. Don't come to Ohio State. I'm going to go to Rutgers. So just stay. Might as well come into the Rutgers. And throughout that process, you know, it was just a whole bunch of stuff going on at the time for me. And I was very young. And I had started talking to schools. And one of the schools that I had started talking to was UNC. And uh, once I, I took a visit there and, uh, you know, decided that that would have been my new home at the time. And so was part of that too. So obviously you said it's it's just the fit, the comfort level at the school, but also there's football decisions being made behind your choice to choose UNC. They were kind of in a transition season, right? So did you know by going to UNC, you were going to get a lot of playing time, be able to come in as a true freshman and play? Yeah. So that's one of the things that um, they told me. Um, uh, and a lot of things, I think it's important to notice, I mean, to listen to what coaches say, you know, a lot of coaches will tell you what you want to hear, you know, what you need to hear. And I think one thing that really stood out with me and Coach and, and UNC was uh, Coach Chizik. Um, at the time, he's uh, a legendary guy. He won a national championship at Auburn. Um, very well respected, um, defensive genius. Um, you know, really, really great coach. And what he told me was, "Hey, Patrice, like you have all the talents to be whoever you want to be in this world of football. Um, if you're willing to work, you're gonna have the opportunity to play. Like we don't do any favorites. We don't do, you know, the best guy in the end of the day will play. And I think you have that opportunity to do that. So as long as you come here, take care of your business." You know, you're going to have the chance to step on the field early as a freshman. And me hearing that is, that's all I needed. That, that's all I know how to do since an early age. All I know how to do is work. All I know how to do is grind. So you're telling me I just come here and grind, do what I have to do. I have a shot. Perfect. I'll bet on myself. I know I can do it. Um, and that with that, um, the scheme, the way they play the defense, I think benefited me as well. I would, I'd be able to perform in the, the, the defensive scheme um, and just the, the, the UNC um, you know, atmosphere, college place. I know that be, it'd be a good fit for me. So once I got there, came in, enrolled in the summer camp, um, did what I had to do, came in, grinded, balled, and, you know, everything they told me was real. I had the opportunity to play, suited up for my first game as a true freshman, and, you know, never looked back since. And so how did it feel to step onto the field for the first time as an NCAA athlete? And not even just an NCAA athlete, but a Canadian NCAA athlete, especially in Division One football. Like, that's not necessarily a common occurrence for kids growing up in Canada. So how did that feel to you to finally step on the field for the first time as a Division One athlete? Ooh, my, my introduction to college football was a unique one, a special one, for, to say the least. I'll never forget it. Um, so I remember, you know, going through camp, you know, earning my, my spot on the team, earning my role as, as a starter, um, true freshman. I, was, I think it was, only, I was, it was only two of us in our class, in our whole freshman class, that got to play. So I was one of the few to really play as a true freshman. And we played, well, we kicked off the Chick-fil-A kickoff bowl against Georgia. Um, and we played in the Georgia Dome in, in uh in, in, in Atlanta. And I remember I stepped on the field. Um, it was the second play of the game. They called my name out, Trisha up. Boom. I run out there on the field. And this is the first time I've ever played in front of a crowd of 90,000 people. Lights, cameras, ESPN. And like, I remember running out there and I was like, whoa, like, 
this is what it's all about. Like, it really hit me. Like, of course, playing in Canada, like, we never had a big stadium like that. Even if you go to the Red Lash games at the time, like, it wasn't that big. Like, even in high school, I never saw anything like it. But, like, I was like, this is what college football is about, hearing the fans and just seeing all those people cheering. And I had to snap out of it quickly. Um, but, you know, for me, I got in the game. I definitely will say, you know, saying that I was nervous was an understatement. Like, I was, like, sweating bullets. Like, I was like, wow. And I was one of the few true freshmen to play. Um, and uh, ended up going through the game, ended up losing. Um, but, you know, having that experience and being able to get there, like, it was just surreal. And I was very just grateful for the opportunity and then, you know, took learned from it a lot um, and uh, was able to, you know, get, get myself back out there and just continue the season and had a great year. We ended up going eight and three that year and had a great freshman experience. So it was very, very nice. Mm -hmm, for sure. And so what is it like to, I was curious, choosing UNC, what's it like going to a, because it, the football program is getting more and more prominent there, but traditionally it's a basketball school. So what was it like going there, playing on the football team when the UNC basketball is so well-renowned? Uh, it was fun. Honestly, it just, we played with a chip on our shoulder. Like we always felt like we had something to prove like, Hey, you know what? It's not all about basketball here. Like we're good too. You know, like come watch us play. Like I'd always tell my classmates in class, Hey, we have the game tonight. Um, you know, come watch us ball out. Like wait, wait to see what we do and how we're going to be performing. And I think nowadays, um, I think there's definitely been a switch where, you know, we're probably equal. Man, I would say the football over there is probably taking a little bit of advantage over basketball um, in the recent years. But if for us, it was just really playing with a chip on our shoulder, just, you know, having something to prove out there and just giving us a little bit of extra motivation, you know, um, being the underdogs, people not really counting us in, um, saying that we're a football school or this and that. We're like, we definitely wanted to prove guys wrong over there and, you know, kind of showcase what we had to do and what we were able to do in our talents. And so in your freshman and sophomore year, you played in all every game. And then in your junior year, you balled out, you started every game, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. And so you originally intended after you were going to, you were originally going to submit your name in the NFL draft after your junior season, but you decided not to after talking to your agents, correct? Yeah. So after my junior year, um, you know, I, I, had, I had a really good season, I had good numbers um, and, you know, considered leaving early. Um, but, you know, with the counsel of my family, you know, with my, my close circle, we felt like, you know, it'd be better for me to come back to school as well, just graduate. Like I didn't graduate at the time I wasn't ready to graduate. And, you know, I think I had a lot of development to do still. And um, just it would be a, a, a way better opportunity for me to come back to school and, and finish it off. So um, that was the decision this, uh, behind that. And so that was your your senior season. Then it was was it your first game where you suffered your injury. So it was actually the second game. Um, so the second game of the year, um, it, was, it, was, it was actually funny. So the first game. So after my, the last game of my junior year, we played a rival team, NC State. Um, we hated NC State, like hated NC State. And at the uh, last of the game, um, you know, after a series of events, a brawl ended up happening. Um, and I got in the mix of it a little bit, you could say. Um, and uh, after that after that happened, uh, I actually ended up getting suspended for the half. So I got suspended for the first half of the first game of the following year. So my senior year, I had to miss the first half of our first game over in South Carolina. So I played that for um, second half of that game. And then the first half of the second season against Miami. So that was our first home game, sold out crowd, everybody going crazy, crazy. Coach Mike Brown being back. Um, and then I ended up tearing my ACL um, right before halftime. So I didn't really play a full game my senior year. It was really just two halves, um, the combination of two halves. But yeah, that's when it happened, the second, second game of the year. Is it true you showed up to, at the beginning of that season wearing a construction vest and a hard hat and goggles at training camp? Is that true? Oh, yeah, most definitely. I pulled up. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I consider myself a funny guy. Um, people might not think so, but I think I'm pretty funny. But I wanted to pull up, you know, do a little something different for training camp, just bring a little bit of fun to it. Um, you know, uh, so I thought, you know, I saw I saw a couple of guys in the NFL do different things. Jalen Ramsey doing what, they, what he was doing. And I was like, what can I do? Like something that nobody has done, like something original. So I was like, hey, man, go once again, going back to what I know is work. I'm here to work. So decided to pull out the full construction outfit, went to Lowe's, uh, got everything, got the hard hat, the vest, um, shirt, everything I needed and pulled up a camp and definitely made a statement. So everybody thought it was kind of pretty cool. And so kind of with, with knowing that, that like this season for you was all about business. You withdrew from the NFL draft to go to, to increase your draft stock, focus on graduating, developing as a person. And then to be sitting in the locker room during that second game and to hear that tore your ACL, what's going through your mind in that moment? Honestly, like it was black. Like I remember when it had happened, uh, I finished the play, got to the sidelines. So that chase, I was like, hey, like, let's take a look at your knee real quick. I'm like, nah, fine, I got it. I'm trying to be, I'm like, I got it, I got it, I'm good. And I'm obviously limping, like something's wrong. So like, nah, we're going to take you inside for an eval. So we go inside the locker room. 
um, sit down with the doc. He looks at my knee. They start talking and then they leave and they're like, all right, just take your pads off. You're done for the day. Like call it a day. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like what's going on? They're like, you're done. Just shower up. We'll talk to you later. I'm like, nah, like, this is not going to happen like that. Like you guys are doctors. You guys have been doing this for X amount of years. Tell me right now what's going on. And that's when our team doctor looked at me and said, I think you tore your ACL. And as soon as he said that, like before he even finished his breath, like I just blacked out. I was like, whoa, like what? Like I just couldn't believe it through my helmet. It was just for like a split two minutes. I just, I could, I just didn't know Like I just couldn't hear anything, couldn't see anything. I just saw black and dark. Um, and then after that, I was able to get calmed down by the staff and they were kind of able to, you know, put me aside and just explain to me and, you know, I was able to, you know, get back to my senses, but it was definitely um, devastating news for me. Um, and it was one of the hardest, hardest times of my life, honestly, um, just putting this perspective, you know, my senior year coming off my junior year, having, you know, all these things, all this excitement, all this hype, um, you know, potential to, to go get drafted, um, this and that, and to have it cut short through an injury, like an ACL was definitely, definitely hard. And so I read somewhere that it was like the first couple of days you were, you were down and disappointed, which is pretty natural, I can imagine. But then eventually you kind of had a perspective shift, right? And you decided you could either sit here and still feel sorry for yourself or you could attack it. And so what led to that, that flip in perspective for you? Uh, honestly, my dad, like it was my dad. Like I remember I was in my room, just like sad, like feeling lights out, just feeling horrible, just very depressed. And then um, I got on the phone with my pops. And he was like, how you feeling? How you feeling? I'm like, yeah, dad, like, this is, this is how I'm feeling this night. He's like, hey, listen, like, literally, this is only two ways you can look at it. You could keep being sorry for yourself, get fat, sit on your bed, not do anything, or you could get up, get your feet on the ground, and get back to it. And I was like, you know what? If those are all my two options, it's a no-brainer what I'm going to choose, right? I'm just going to choose to do what I know best, and that's to work hard and to get right back on feet. And, uh, and from that moment on, I didn't even care about, you know, what happened. It had happened. It wasn't what it was. I accepted it. And my mindset switched to just do everything I could do to get back on that field. Regardless of what it was, I'm going to attack everything. I'm going to go 10 times harder than I've ever won before. My main goal is to get back on my feet. And once I picked that mindset, it was just straight work. Like, really just straight head down. Just keep going at it. Keep going at it. And then also my teammates, um, I can't say enough about them, my support system. Um, I've always been blessed to have people around me that, have shown me genuine love, um, friends, family, um, you know, anybody, the fans, they were just always there to keep my spirits up. And um, I was just able to just keep focusing, keep grinding and, and get back on my feet. So that's kind of how that switch happened. And I owe it all to my pops. How do you not let that kind of the injury get you down after that? Because obviously there's going to be that burst of motivation after you talk to your dad, you're like, you know what, I'm going to attack this. But as you go through the process of recovering from an ACL injury, which is not short, like I'm pretty sure it's usually eight, nine months because of COVID, it took you like a year. Mm -hmm. How do you keep pushing through for, for 12 months and not get down on yourself and not let yourself kind of lose that motivation and that drive to, to get back on the field? Um, discipline. Um, I think discipline is one of the big things. Um, just, you know, Discipline, my drive, and my love for the game are the three main things that I can credit to. Um, and then uh, obviously, most importantly, like God, um, I did a lot of praying at that time. I, and I got a lot of strength from God, I believe. So I think he was able to put his hand on me and really just give me all the tools I needed to keep pushing. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I had a dream and that's to play professional football. That's always been my dream since I was a kid. And why stop now? You know, I was so close. Why stop now? And um, I felt like I, I owed it to myself. I owed it to my parents. I owed it to my family. I owed it to the city of Ottawa to keep going. Like I could not quit. Like that was never an option for me. Like to quit and to just stop so short was just never an option. So just always having those daily reminders of what I'm doing. And I think one thing is important is regardless of whatever you're doing in life, as, uh, as long as you understand your why, that should serve as your motivation to get through anything. I understood why I was doing it, like why I was out here, why I was putting myself through this situation, why I was putting myself through these workouts is to ultimately achieve this goal. So just throughout that whole process, those 12 months, obviously, you know, you have your days where, you know, you're a little bit more down than usual, but being able to pick back up and fall back on, um, on, on, on what you believe in it and your why, I think that served as my motivation. And then once again, just my, my friends, my supporting cast, like really, I think that's, I wouldn't be able to, it's not something that you could do by yourself. Um, Definitely was very tough, but just, you know, having the encouragement, you know, those text messages, you know, keep doing your thing. Oh, we're seeing your progress. Just that also kept me motivated. So those things all in all 
um, just made it, um, you know, the transition easy for me and just helped me um, keep, keep, keep on my grind. And so Ottawa has been there for you through, throughout your entire life. And the only time it wasn't there and it was because of COVID was when you were injured. And so you had to go back because you were home, but you had to try and go back to Chapel Hill. But because of COVID, the borders were closed. So you had to like appeal to the Canadian embassy or something like that to get back, right? Yeah, it was crazy. So when COVID first hit, it was like, you know, panic everywhere. Like it was like a pandemonium. Like, everybody was like, oh my God, COVID-19, the end of the world, like blah, blah. And I was like, whoa, like, if the world's about to end, I'd rather end it with my family, right? Like, I got to go see home. I got to go see my people that I love. So um, I was able to actually get a flight, go straight to Canada. Um, my mom, my parents were like, yeah, we need you home. Like, let's just all be together as a family, um, you know, throughout the state because we don't know what's going on. It just hit everybody out of nowhere. So I flew back home. Um, I think it was in March or, uh, yeah, March. And then, you know, got home and I was in the middle of my rehab process. So before that, prior to that, you know, I was rehabbing each and every day, having sessions two times a day. I'm um, just, you know, keep grinding, working. I was working and working. And then I got back home. I was like, all right. So we didn't really know what was going to happen. So I was having Zoom sessions with my trainer. So I literally would go on Zoom on my phone, set up my phone somewhere in the house or outside. And they'd be like, all right, do this. They would walk me through a rehab session. They would do this. So like we were doing everything through Zoom. And then at one point after a week, I was like, all right, like Zoom workouts are great, but I need certain equipment. Like there's certain things I need. There's certain things I need to do to, you know, keep progressing. Um, and unfortunately, everything was on shut. Everything was locked down. Like everything was closed. I couldn't go to no clinic. I couldn't go to no physio place. I couldn't see no doctors. Like everything was just shut down. And I'm like, man, like I got to go back. Like I go back to at least UNC to where we have our team doctors where, you know, it might not be open, but it's regulated at a certain point. Like I could have access to certain things that I don't have at home. Um, and for when we decided that, you know, that's what we needed to do. Um, so UNC was very supportive. The doctors wrote a letter um, to give out to the embassy, um, to whoever it may concern. And then I went to the embassy. I was like, hey, explain the situation. I was a Division One athlete. Um, I'm current in the process, in the middle of my rehab uh, uh, process. Um, you know, we have a season coming up, this and that. And, uh, you know, luckily enough for me, they were very understanding. They were very supportive about it. And uh, they made it happen where they allowed me to go, you know, get back on the plane and fly back to the States. I remember I was on a uh, on a commercial plane, there was only two people on it. Like all the seats were empty and just me and this other guy on a plane and, you know, got back. And then um, I got, I flew back in April and I hadn't been home since. So this is my first time back home since that. So it's been like almost a year and a half. So yeah, that's kind of how that, all that had went down. How's it feel to finally be back? It feels amazing. Like it feels like crazy. Like, like once at first, we, so we drove back up here and, you know, just being on the highway, seeing the road, seeing the signs, you know, Ottawa, like familiar, like being familiar with, oh, I know what this is. I know what I'm doing. Like, it just felt like great. Um, The air is different. Like breathing in the air was cool. I was like, man, this is Canadian fresh air. You know what I mean? Like I'm back home with my people. Like it's just been great. Um, I honestly feel like the time is too short. I'm, I'm only here for five days. So I'm trying to get, do as much as I can, spend as much time with the, the people that mean to me the most, as much as I can. Um, but just being back home is just great. You know, there's no place like home. That's a cliche, but that's a fact. You know, there's no place like home. Like home is home. And this is where I want, like I grew up at. So um, I'm always going to have love for the city. And just being back has just been amazing. That's awesome. And so, but I mean, prior, so prior to this trip, I mean, dealing with, dealing, you were dealing with your injury, you were not able to come home. There's a global pandemic and we don't have to talk about this if you don't want to, but you also lost an uncle to COVID-19 as well during all of this, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, um, like everybody else, you know, we were really unsure what was going on. And um, so my uncle, he lived in New York and when COVID had first hit, um, New York was one of the, the places where it was affected the most, where they had the most cases, um, a very high rate of deaths. So New York was very greatly affected compared to every other state. Um, and um, yeah, um, my my uh, my uncle, he was a uh, he owned a restaurant. Um, uh, he owned a, a Haitian restaurant in, in in Brooklyn, and very very hardworking man. Like kind of like my dad. Like they didn't take any days off. Like he didn't not ever he never went to see the doctor. Like he always was like, you know, I got it. I'm good. I'll be able to push through it. I got it. I'm good. So um, he ended up starting feeling sick and he thought it was a cold and, you know, in his fashion, like, nah, I can't take a day off. Like I got to go to work. I got to provide, I got to do this. And I think, you know, he got to a point where um, he just got too sick and then ended up going to the hospital. And then um, unfortunately he just passed away. And it was a, a, a definitely hard time for, for our family. Um, very difficult, especially not being able to travel anywhere and not being able to be there for my aunt, for my cousins. Um, you know, he left behind, you know, um, two daughters um, that are my cousins. That's very tough, a son. Um, so, uh, it, it, it was, it was a hard situation, um, most definitely, but, you know, able to overcome it and just being there for, for, for our family spiritually the best way we could, um, make it happen. But that's really when, for me, that we really brought the whole COVID thing, you know, we don't really know about a situation until it hits home and it hit home hard. And now something that I knew, somebody that I loved, somebody that, 
I actually, you know, had a relationship with and be affected by the whole virus. And that's kind of like, all right, like this is not just a joke. Like this is something that's real and that's affected the lives of millions and millions of people. So um, definitely from that point on, being more cautious, being more, you know, aware and, you know, less ignorant about the situation, just trying to spread the spread the word out to all my friends and families and, you know, just trying to do the right thing to get this to get this over this bump. Thanks for sharing that, man. And I'm sorry for your loss. Have you been able to go and visit your family in Brooklyn since then? Because I know you couldn't at first, right? Yeah. So since then, so really the first time I was able to do so was when I transferred out to Rutgers. So when I went back and, you know, got established here, finally settled down in Jersey, um, I was able to go visit my grandmother, visit my cousin, spend some time with them and see the aunt and family. So um, once again, you know, being being in Jersey, being at Rutgers allows me to do that. You know, having that access to my family, being right there is just amazing. So I'm definitely making sure I'm not taking anything for granted, not taking any time for granted, and just showing love to the people that, you know, that you love. Had there not been COVID, so if there had been no pandemic, would you have, would your eligibility have expired prior to this season? Um, It, it went, uh, let's see. Yeah, it, it would have expired, yeah, if there wasn't expired, because I would have had, because uh, I never registered it, and the year that I got hurt was my redshirt year, and then the year, the COVID year, the COVID season was my last final year, the the, the my fifth year was my last year, so um, if we didn't have the uh, extra COVID um, season by the incident delay, that would have been, uh, my career would have been done over this past season, yeah. Okay, so, so you were able to come back and play end of last year then? Yeah, so I ended up, you know, m- with perseverance i ended up getting myself back on the field for uh, i think I, I started five games um you know was able to get there um but obviously didn't play a full year um you know was still you know coming back but i was able to get back on the field and you know going out there and showing showcasing my talent and performing um but you know just didn't have enough time and then you know some teams that canceled games it was just a huge mess with the whole covid situation which was all messed up um so definitely was grateful for the opportunity one day granting everybody the extra year of eligibility and so we, we kind of talked about You'd mentioned when you stepped on the field for your first game ever, there was obviously some nerves and it's the first time for 90,000 people. What are the nerves like when you come back for the first time after a major injury? You know what I mean? Because from my understanding, you hadn't had an injury anywhere like that before. So Mm -hmm. the nerves have to be different, but they have to be there, right? When you step on the field for the first time? Um, Most definitely. Um, It was, it was a feeling I never felt before. Um, That was probably the first time I was like, okay, like, a little uncertain about things because you know especially being acl and at the corner position you know that's something that's you know not minor it's a it's a major injury um but you know i knew i worked hard to, to get back to where i was at to get back to that point um and i knew you know i couldn't let it affect me but i definitely had the crazy butterflies you know coming back and just you know just proving pretty much it was just proving myself that i could do this like that's really what it was all about just proving myself that i could go out there and just be the player that i was um and you know i was able to do that i don't get back obviously you know it took some time um, but, you know, through pushing it, through keep working, you know, being, you know, my coaches helping me out, the staff helping me out, you know, making me feel at 100%. And that's one thing I, I always told myself, I wouldn't go out there unless I felt at 100%. So if there was anything that was wrong, you know, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't feel like I did my team justice if I was going there and half-assing anything. You know, if I want to go out there, I want to be able to perform at the highest level I could. So um, every time I was out there, I felt good, um, you know, was able to move around well, but definitely was crazy nerves. Um, but once you go, once that whistle blows and you're playing, you just forget about everything. You're just in there having fun and you're in the zone. So it was able to, you know, get past that pretty quickly. And so you got to play as a part of UNC's first Orange Bowl, right? First Texas A&M? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. How was that? How was that game? That was just a great experience all around. Just a bowl game. And I think, you know, um, we started, we, we had the game in January and COVID had kind of, you know, relaxed a little bit, especially down south for sure, where, you know, things were starting to open up a little bit. Things were a little bit more lenient and we we're in Miami. We we're in the 305. So we spent a couple of days in the 305. Um, it was just a great, great experience. Um, just the hype about everything, the Orange Bowl. That's one of the things that you aspire to reach um, in your playing career, especially at the collegiate level, um, playing Texas A&M. Um, and, you know, it was just a great time, great experience. Um, had a great, it was a great game for us. Um, I, I definitely ended up coming up short at the end of it, but um, just a great experience all around. And, you know, it was definitely grateful that I was, able to be able, I was able to be a part of it. And you knew that that was going to be your last game of the Tar Heel, right? Um, yeah, most definitely. I, I thought, I, I knew that that was the last game, you know, regardless of, uh, at that time I thought, you know, I was going to come back and I mean, uh, I was going to go and put my name into the draft again. Um, but I definitely knew that that was my last game as a Tar Heel. Is that weird to know that it's going to be your last game? Uh, yeah, it's definitely a mix of emotions, excitement, um, you know, sadness, um, you know, just unknown. It was just a mix of emotions, but, you know, just being there with my brothers, you know, that made it all better. Just knowing that, hey, I get to do this one last time with my bros that I grinded hard with throughout the whole year. 
um, my coaches that have seen me struggle, that have seen me come back from injury. Um, it just brought a smile to my face. And, you know, bowl games are, are, are definitely competitive, but, you know, it's an extra game of the season. So it's like, you know, I was just definitely just enjoying it, um, just soaking everything in, looking back at the whole career. Um, it was definitely a special moment for me and a, and a great time. And so if I were to ask you, what are some of your favorite moments from UNC? What would you say? Uh, one that sticks out off rip is my freshman year when we beat Florida State at Florida State with the last second uh, field goal. I think it was a 50 yard or a kicker. Nick Wilder kicked one, booted it. We all looked at it, went through the uprights, huge upset. And he ran across the field doing their chop like this. Like that was one of the most badass moments I've ever seen. Like he had, we have a huge picture of it framed in the stadium. Like that was something that was surreal. Um, that game for sure. Other than that, playing Pitt, um, I think it was my, my sophomore year and um, last second touchdown. Um, uh, Virginia Tech for me personally was one of my favorite memorable moments. That was like my coming out game in my junior year. That uh, my junior year we played Virginia Tech at home, um, one of our first night games. Sold out crowd and I just absolutely balled out. Had my first career interception that game. Um, did my thing and kind of put myself on the map. I think that those are definitely mem uh, memories that I remember. And then other than that, it's just the everyday locker room shenanigans like going out there just being with the boys, like, you know, you grind with them every day. I see them every day. I see the same ugly faces every day, uh, those guys every day joking around, um, just, you know, being guys. And I think those are the memories that I always cherish for me for the rest of my life. So you said how you originally, you originally thought it was going to be your last game at UNC because you were debating, you were considering putting your name in the draft. You helped me to decide to do that, but you did get drafted in the CFL draft that year. Is that something you were expecting to have happen? Yeah, I knew it was a possibility. Um, I didn't really know it would happen. Like I was honestly surprised when it did happen, but I knew it was a possibility because you know of the fact that it was my draft year um, of eligibility in the CFL draft, um, and I knew that they always had the option to you know draft players. It's not the first time that they've dra uh, drafted um, you know players playing in the south, uh, down south in NCAA. Uh, so I knew the process that was going on, and also I was watching it because I had a lot of friends back home that were playing in OUA or you know our seg like getting ready for the CFL draft. So I was definitely tuned in. Um, um, but when it happened, I was, I was definitely surprised, but grateful. I mean, at the end of the day, that's still an opportunity for me to play, be a professional football player. And that's everything I wanted to do. And I mean, I'm a big CFL fan. I, I used to go to the uh, Red Black games all the time. Well, they were called the Renegades back in the day when I, when I was growing up, um, and Lance downfield, um, just going out there. And so once I got the call from the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, I'm um, definitely coming by surprise, but I was like, wow, like it definitely felt like a dream come true. Like it was definitely still a special moment for me um, just to get that call and knowing that a team, an organization, a professional team uh, drafted me and uh, believed in me and uh, wanted me to be a part of their of what they had going on. It was definitely great and um, very, very grateful for the opportunity for sure. And so a bit of a bit of a two pronged question kind of based on that. It was one, when did you make the decision to go back to school and to withdraw your name from the NFL draft? And two, why did you decide that you wanted to go back to school to then enter the NFL draft as opposed to going to the CFL, playing a year professionally and trying to make the jump to the NFL that way? Yeah, so for me, it was, um, so once we got done with the, uh, the bowl game, um, went back to my house uh, in North Carolina, sat down with my people, my age uh, at the time, um, just the, my, my, my uh you know, my circle. And we, we weighed out the options. It was like, okay, right now, draft projection is this we're going to be at. This, this is what we're thinking. Um, you could either, you know, track your chances or come back to school, show that you're really, you know, healthy. You know, come, I only played five games this past following year. Um, didn't have a full season. The whole COVID year um, was happening. There was no NFL combine, no pro days. It's just a bunch of stuff was, you know, all over the place. Um, and then once I, you know, I heard that and uh, really sat down and realized, you know, I could start on my grad school. Um, you know, have an extra year to really showcase myself, have a full season under my belt post-injury. Um, it was really just a no-brainer, just, you know, having the opportunity to really come back to school and really, you know, boost my stock was really the, the reason behind coming back. Um, and from that point on, when I decided I wanted to come back, it was, you know, whether or not, you know, where I would go or what I would you know, exercise my options then end up going to Rutgers being a possibility. Um, and then the reason why I didn't, you know, go to the CFL and try to go to NFL from there is because, um, I believe the rule is if you do go to CFL, I think you have to go there for a minimum of two years. So it's like you have to fill a two-year requirement um, under contract with the team, and then you could possibly have the opportunity to move forward. So um, learning that, um, you know, I felt like, you know, just going back to school and really starting my master's for free, you know, it was, it was a great, it was a, it was a big part of it too. Of course. So you were, you were pretty much ready to pull the trigger on Oklahoma, but then last minute decided to go to Rutgers, right? Yeah. So um, once I entered my name in the portal, it was like recruiting all over again, like everything was going on. Um, you know, coaches reaching out left and right, um, you know, but I had the great support uh, system uh, from UNC and they helped me out a lot um, in terms of, you know, trying to find a new home. But yeah, I was definitely uh, 
highly considering Oklahoma was ready to go there. Um, but, you know, I was talking to Rutgers. I had a talk with Coach Shiano, um, our head coach. And um, I can't say enough good things about Coach Shiano. Like, he is the man. Like, when I tell you he's the man, like, he's the man. So I um, sat down with him. I think we got on, we were on the phone for about two hours. And um, after I hung up that phone, I was like, man, I got to go to Rutgers. Like, this is the place for me. This is where I got to go. Um, and just, and all things in, taken in consideration, just me wanting to go there in the first place. Like, it just came back. It felt like everything came back full circle. It felt like, you know, that was just meant to be, like, God, like he, he put me in a situation for this. Like, this is my moment. This is where I got to end up. So that kind of made the decision, you know, I had to, you know, lock in and go with my gut and go to Rutgers. And, you know, I've loved it, everything about it so far. And so did you get to play spring ball? Yeah. So I was able to, um, you know, get all my stuff ready, all my paperwork ready and uh, enroll in the spring. So I, I had all, I was able to do with the whole spring session with them, um, go through spring ball, you know, go good with the team and practice and do all these type of things. So it was definitely, definitely beneficial for me. And so when you leave Ottawa now after this five-day trip, is it going pretty much jumping straight into training camp then? Straight into camp. So I leave on the 2nd, which is on the Monday, and then we report for camp on the 3rd. So, you know, we're right into the group of things. So I'm ready to get the ball rolling um, straight into camp. So I'm excited for sure. And so what is your expectation for yourself this year? What are kind of some of your goals heading into it? Um, just help my team win as many games as possible. Um, that's the main thing for me um, going into the Big Ten. Um, you know, just trying to help Rutgers get back to the name that it once was. Um, just going out there, balling out, and doing my part into winning games. I think that's the most important thing um, is to win. That's whether whatever you're doing, the most important thing is to win. Uh, in terms of individual goals, it's just to, you know, go out there and showcase my talent, like being able to so go from the ACC and playing well, going to the Big Ten and just playing well as well. Like that's where I kind of want to go out there and prove that I'm a, I'm a contender. I'm a ball player and I'm a baller. Like that's, that's really what it is. Um, and just showing that I'm healthy, ready to go, you know, having a, you know, two years removed now from my injury, um, feeling in the best shape I've ever been in my life. Like it's really just to go out there and ball out and do what I do best and to showcase my talent. So that's really what I have uh, in mind for this year, upcoming year, just helping my team win as much as possible, as much as possible, um, in any way, shape or form I can. And then other than that, just showing the world who I am, who Patrice Renee is and why he deserves to play at a high level. So, yeah. Is your family, do you know yet or not, if they're going to be able to come down and watch you play? Yeah, as long as, you know, all the restrictions are, you know, good with their terms of COVID and uh, all the travel restrictions, they're definitely going to come down. Um, you know, that's a trip that we're used to making throughout our life, just going to visit my grandmother in New York. Um, we've done that trip many, many, many times growing up. Um, I used to spend actually all my summers, most of my summers, I used to come down and spend them with my grandma. So that trip is something that's very familiar to us. So as long as everything's clear with the borders and the whole COVID situation, they're definitely going to come out to as many games as they possibly can. And have they been able to come down and watch you at UNC like they've seen you play college ball before? Yeah, so they've come down to, uh, I believe, uh, two UNC games. Um, at home games, and then they were able to come to some away games. So we played at Syracuse, for example, um, two years ago. So they were able to come to that Syracuse game and have my whole family there. Um, it was cool. Just balled out that game, too. I had, my, I had a pig. Uh, home recovery just went crazy. So just always nice to have the family. I always tell my mom, like, I can't not perform when mom was watching me. So, you know, I got to put on the show for her. So they've been able to watch a couple games throughout my career. That's awesome. Well, hope COVID restrictions are, are light enough that they can come watch you play probably more often too now that you're so close at Rutgers. Oh yeah, for sure. But talk to me a little bit about kind of, because we've talked a lot about being the athlete side, but you're a student athlete. Talk to me about the student side of that. So you said you're getting your master's right now and that's in management and labor relations, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so why did you choose that as your major? Um, so really, so for me, my undergrad, I did my undergrad in communications and sociology. Um, you know, that's what I, I graduated with at UNC, double majored. And, you know, act, like being a student athlete, you know, a lot of people think it's a lot of glitz and glamour, but, you know, you really do got to go to school. Like you got to go to class. You got to, you know, maintain a certain amount of uh, uh, a GPA level. Like it's not just all fun and games. Like I don't know why there's a, a misconception that, you know, athletes get it get it easy. Now we grind just as much as hard, like, just as hard as anybody else, you know. Uh, so definitely took school seriously. And that's something, you know, growing up, my mom, my parents, like they definitely made that a point. Like there was no football without school. Like that's something that went hand in hand for me um just making sure I was on top of my academics so um having graduated um with my bachelor's in uh, communications and sociology um business and management was something that I always was interested in like I was my goal at the end of the day is to you know own my own business or something like that I was always interested in the, in the business side of things and then labor relations um you know just understanding the company just understanding you know what employees are going through this and that like all these type of things are something that's interested in me and Rutgers um, had a great school, you know, I had that program and I felt like, you know, it was a no brainer for me to go out there and, you know, get that started um, and just go through with it. And so what is like the typical, a typical week schedule look like for you as a football player? Like what is, 
class, like when are classes, when is practice? Like obviously you're watching film, you got meetings, like what does a week in the life look like for you? Yeah. So, um, really, um, for us, so it depends whether you're, it depends on the program. So some teams will practice in the morning, some teams will practice in the afternoon. So I've had both. Um, but for us, I just give you like an average, uh, a day of a, a team that practices in the morning. So we'll have to wake up around 5.30, 5.45, meeting around 6.30, your first meeting, team meeting. Getting team meeting, 6.30, I'll go for about an hour. And then you have special teams meetings. So from like 7.30 to like 8.15 or something, you have special teams. And then around 10 o'clock, 10.30, you end up having practice. So after special teams, you go to position meeting. So it's meeting, 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 then practice. So we start from around 6.30 and you do football, like specific terms of terms of practice meetings until about one or two o'clock, um, get out of practice. So after that, you end up going to your study hall. So if you have study hall, um, you take care of your academics for that study hall classes, your class schedule is everything is done after football in terms of like your, your hourly day. So you go to study hall, go to your classes, do what you have to do academically, and then you get that done. So you probably get done with classes around five o'clock, six o'clock, and you eat, eat, uh, eat uh, dinner, whatever it may be. Um, and then you have to do your homework. Then you get time to do your homework, um, do what you have to do in terms of academics. And then after that, you have to watch film, um, making sure you're reviewing your notes from the meeting earlier that we did. So you get ready for the next day of practice, um, going with your coaches, watching more film on the opponent, um, watching film on yourself, just trying to get yourself prepped up for the next day. Um, and that's just a continuous cycle. So then once you get in it, it's like, the ball just keeps rolling. Just morning practices, meetings, meetings, school, repeat. So morning practice. So that kind of has the ball that gets rolling. And then after that, you get towards the game week. Um, Friday is kind of like more easier where, you know, we're pretty much just focused on the game and what we have to do. And then you play Saturday and it keep, keeps going like that. And so that's just a constant cycle week in and week out all season? Yeah. And those days go by fast. Like it's like, oh, wow. Like they like already you started off in September and the next thing you know it's November. You're like, whoa, shoot. We already played like six, seven games. So, yeah. And so, like, talk to me about learning the playbook because that's one thing as someone who's never played football, I've always been curious about. Like, I obviously, so for context, I worked with the Red Blacks for for a year, um, but like, I worked on the media side, so I didn't really see it. But like, as an athlete, like, how do you try and learn the whole playbook? Um, really, it's just just put it in the categorical notes. I think that's one thing that really um, helps me out is just not trying to hold, learn it as a like as a whole at first is just breaking it down to different pieces so for example on defense in my position like okay these calls are for this type of defense zone these five calls are for man defense so trying to just break it down to categories where i can use certain points to remind myself of certain things and not just trying to have to memorize every single play i think makes it a lot easier um i think for me um especially as a corner i think it's a lot easier than other positions in the sense of learning as in my job mainly and most of the time, half the time is just to guard and receive, like make sure he does not catch the ball. Like that's part of my job in the defense. So we put a lot of man to man, um, just going out there and sticking the guys more so about my technique and how I go about doing it. In terms of scheme levels, I think as a corner, it's a lot more easier than let's say a quarterback that has to know everybody's thing. But um, I think for me uh, also the one thing I like to do is just be aware of what's going on. And I think that's helped me out as a player, just not only knowing my job, but everybody's job. That makes the game a lot you know, smoother, just being able to react faster, just knowing what's going on and anticipating things. But I think just learning a playbook is just to not try to overwhelm yourself with everything at a bunch. It's just, just to break it down in certain categories where you are able to understand and break down and, and you know, grab pieces from different places and then bring it all together. Okay. And and so before we before we jump off here, I want to make sure we talk about the new changes with the NIL and you signing and you working with your work with Sportsman. So kind of to set the scene, can you kind of explain so NIL name image like this, now you can profit off your name, your image, and your likeness. Can you explain to the person listening to this like exactly how strict it was before these changes came into play? So yeah, this is like one of the most groundbreaking major stories that's been happening in the world of sports in many, many years. Like having the NIL decision go through is something that's definitely um, you know, monumental and, and extraordinary for for everybody, I think. Um, but pretty much like for the average listener that's listening that's not really aware, like so before as a college athlete, let's say, you know, you went to a big time school, you know, you're playing, you're balling out. Um, and let's say me, Patrice Renee, I, you know, had a game, had five interceptions, went crazy. Um, and somebody wanted to, you know, buy my jersey in the store. Like people would go out there, buy the jersey, and I would get nothing from it. Or people would go out there, spend the money, and I would never, like, you would not, as an athlete, you wouldn't be able to see none of that money come to you. Like you're putting all those hours in, you're putting all that work in. At the end of the day, everybody's coming to see you perform. Like you, like the players are the ones that drive the system at the end of the day. Like nothing happens without the players. And without us, like, you know, 
the NCAA or major companies making profiting so much off the athletes, it was kind of like, well, what are we able to do? So we couldn't, you know, make money off of our name. We couldn't really use ourselves, our brands, and, you know, profit off that. So it was a lot of restrictions in terms of what you could and could not do, um, what you could, like, you couldn't accept free food anywhere. Like, if you went to the store and was like, hey, man, great game, this meal's on us, like, you couldn't do that. Um, uh, you couldn't, uh, it was just, like, crazy, crazy restrictions. Like, it's a lot, like, you go into, but pretty much now with the new rule, it's like we're able to really just profit off our own name. It's not really going above and beyond but it's really the value of yourself as a player like whatever you feel like you deserve whatever you feel like you're valued or your worth is you're able to finally you know make some some money off of it which is which is great and so if you'd broken the rules before you would have lost your eligibility been like suspended for a year or something like that yeah so if you end like you know there was a whole list of what you couldn't do and if you ended up you know being caught doing those things um you definitely lose game time um sometimes a full year sometimes a whole year sometimes a career so there's definitely been some major cases where you know we've seen um you know things happen with major guys with players you know um go down a path and have something happen and they lost their eligibility they couldn't play anymore i had to go pro earlier this and that so there was a lot of restrictions that made you know things a lot di- very difficult for, for for guys to to kind of make a living and you know help their families out or whatever the case may be no for sure i remember so so this is episode 150. And I think all the way back at the beginning of the podcast, it was like episode 18 or something like that. And I interviewed a, a, a division one golfer and we took a photo of my apartment. I have like a sign for the podcast. We took a photo with the sign that has the show name on it. And he called me after he's like, Hey, I just, I talked to like, I talked to my school. Don't post that photo anywhere. Cause like I could potentially lose my eligibility for taking a photo with you with this sign. And my, my podcast makes no money. No one's making money off of it at the time, but I still couldn't post it. So just, just how strict it was, was, was insane. And so when did you start to hear that they might actually be changing these rules and you might be able to profit off your own name, image, and likeness? So for me, it was actually my senior, my, my true senior year. Um, you know, they were talking about possibly having an NIL thing go through and I was like, damn, like, I'm not going to be able to enjoy that because I'm not the lead. It's about to be my last year. So, you know, at first, when I first heard of it, I was like, all right, like I heard it was like going in one year out there. I was like, it was great for all the guys coming up, but you know, it wasn't really going to affect me, which just sucked. But you know, I wasn't really, I didn't really know what was going on. Um, but then once I came up, decided to come back to school, it was actually full effect. And then you know, the bus started getting there. I was like, oh yeah, this is a thing that's going to be able to be taken effect now. I was like, that's a whole completely game changer. Like now, for example, for example, the game NCAA, like everybody used to play, like people used to buy the game to play for the players, but the players would never see none of that money. Like you, everybody would spend $60 on a game and play with you. And you'd be like, well, I'm the one playing. Like what's what's the word with that? Like, you know what I mean? It was kind of weird. Um, jersey sales, we know going once again less. So all these little things that, that, that people profited on based off your performance, based off your hard work, based off your dedication, um, we're able to kind of, you know, take ownership of that now. And it's great. So when, when those changes came into effect, did you have like a meeting with the school? Like, did they kind of walk you through what this means now for you? Or was it kind of just like, Hey, this change has happened and you're trying to figure it out on your own. Almost. I mean, I know for us at Rutgers specifically, I can only speak for us and what we're doing. Um, they do a really good job of just education. Like they, we've had meetings, they've had people come in. Um, they've had mentors come in, advisors come in, just, you know, tell us what's going on and how to deal with it. Cause I think, you know, it could definitely be a distraction for a lot of people, you know, if you're now you're trying to you know, focus more on certain deals and this and that. Um, but I think for us at Rutgers and what we're doing is, you know, Coach Seattle, he does a really great job of just getting us the information that we need, making sure we're making the right decisions, making sure, you know, we're listening to the right things, we have the right information, where we're able to go about things. And at the end of the day, the main thing stays the main thing, and that's football. Like, that's the main message is, like, main thing must stay the main thing. Like, you could go out there and try to seek out certain sponsorships, seek out certain opportunities, but if you're not balling, I mean, nobody wants to sign you, nobody wants to give you opportunities. So definitely... Um, keeping the main thing, the main thing. And I think that helps us stay grounded, helps us stay, you know, focused on what we have to do and our goal at hand. And that's to win games and win the big 10 championship. So um, for us, I don't, it wasn't uh, just, Hey, do whatever y'all want. Y'all can have freedom. Um, there was definitely a lot of education. It's still an ongoing process. You know, it's fairly new. Things are changing each and every day about it, different rules. So we're always up to date. Um, and I'm there very grateful for Coach Shadow, what he's been doing and just making sure we have all the information we need, have lawyers come in. We've met with lawyers, you know, advisors coming in. Just basically just giving us the whole rundown so we're able to make the right decisions, not mess up, might not do the wrong thing. Um, making sure, you know, we go through the right process of everything, document everything to keep everything smooth. And correct me if I'm wrong, but like with the rules right now, as a Canadian athlete, you are impacted differently by NIL, right? Like you can't work with American companies or something like that. Like what's the rule for guys like you? 
Yeah. So for us, like for international students, so we're on a, a visa at the time. So um, it's still a lot of great area because obviously just started and they're still working on it. But as of now, um, we're a little constrained in terms of the business we could do with these companies since we're uh, on a visa, which means we're not a working, we're not on a working status, we're on a student status. So let's say we were to make a deal with uh, uh, an American company, you know, Iris is going to want to take it. Uh, uh, you know, we'd have to pay taxes on that. There'd have to be some type of thing to go on where, you know, it gets regulated. So um, in terms of that sense, you know, things have to be paused. But at the end of the day, like being a Canadian um, citizen, again, a Canadian, um, you know, um, athlete, there's definitely opportunities that I could tap into back home, which, you know, opens a whole different playing field that, you know, a lot of guys in record don't have. And so with being able to have a bunch of opportunity back home, that's what led to you. So you signed with the sportsman, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, really in a sense like sign but also just being a part of of uh of sportsman is the company that um, my friends and i started together um you know it's a marketing and branding um firm um that really and media really specifically uh that helps out you know gives the platform to you know athletes entertainers influencers icons um mainly from the city of ottawa ontario because that's where we started off that's where we, you know we got brought up um but just get allowing them to you know go out there and brand themselves, you know, as an individual, not only, you know, as what they're doing, but go above and beyond that, giving opportunities to seek out, you know, uh, deals or just to put your name out, out there and really capitalize on, on, on who you are and tell your story and things like that. So um, Sportsman is definitely um, something that we are very proud of, very um, excited about. Um, it's up and coming and, and we're growing, you know, starting to get, get the ball rolling on things. Um, and uh, really it's inclusive to, you know, not just, athletes um like i mentioned but you know they're various people like you know musicians whatever it may be um men women um any type age gender sex there's no you know discrimination on anything um and I, we definitely have something special happening right here talk to me a little bit more about so, so you're starting with your friends like you said about kind of f keeping the family close for lack of a better word you know what i mean like you're working with a, a startup agency as opposed to an agency that's been doing this for a while which i think is super cool for you to kind of be involved from the ground floor and do it with your friends talk about how important it is to you to keep the family close keep the family close in this situation while you build this agency? Um, it means the world. And I think uh, with the NIL, especially with my situation, um, it kind of gave us that that push that we kind of needed. Like, hey, like, this is an opportunity that we could tap into. Um, and there's, like I mentioned, we have a whole bunch of Canadian athletes that are, that are playing at an elite level that, you know, would need this type of representation, would need this type of platform to, you know, have that opportunity to reach out those goals, to reach out those different places. And uh, having those guys um, that I've grew up with coming together and being, you know, creating something special that could actually, you know, become bigger than we've ever imagined is, is amazing. And um, going against it, keeping the family close is it's kind of showing that, you know, the type of guys that we are, the type of love that we have for something is genuine, you know, it's genuine vibes, like it's genuine, authentic vibes. Like this is something that I putting my heart and soul into that I know that my brother that I grew up with throughout the years is putting his heart and soul to as well. Um, so it's definitely something that, you know, we take pride in and um, also like our roots is something that we're also very, very, very prideful about just being from Ottawa, Ontario, homegrown um, with the town that we have is something that we want to show the world. That's what we're doing here at Sportsman. Which I think is really cool with kind of throwing back to you because we talked throughout this entire podcast just how significant Ottawa has been to you and we talk about how it's difficult for guys from Ottawa to kind of get their name out there and not only are you helping to to change that through your work on the field but now the work you're doing off the field with Sportsman you and the rest of the founders there you're now having another impact on the community as well not just putting a name on the map but also helping everyone else get established as well which I think is super cool oh yeah most definitely um that's that's one thing that is like for example being able to get on this podcast like with you like having this opportunity to tell my story like it's all throughout the company like out all through the guys like setting that up on um, uh, allowing guys to go out there and really just make them make the brand on themselves like really just take advantage of all the opportunities that are there for us to take and really put ottawa not only ottawa but you know put yourself on the map put your city on the map and um, i think it's definitely special homegrown and you don't really have that um, i don't think in canada we have that opportunity like guys are always going back to the states to try to do things like why go down there when we could have it homegrown? Like, why do this when we have it? Everything we need right in front of us. Like, we're all together. We're all this together. Like, we can make it happen. And uh, we, you guys are definitely going to see something special and a lot of different athletes coming through and just going out there and just building it and taking off. And so how great for you, because we talked about keeping the main thing, the main thing. And so now you have Sportsman to, to handle all the stuff with NIL and do all those deals for you while you can keep the main thing, the main thing. How important is that to you coming into your last season here within the NCAA? Yeah. Um, it's definitely, it's, it's a great, and it's a blessing. And it's like going back to just the family. I know that they get those guys have my back and those guys, I could trust them with everything. You know, James Thomas, Harvin Lotur, um, Yannick Mouli, um, Jordy Wands, like those are my boys that I grew up with. And for me, 
for me to just being able to go out there and just focus on what I have to do is playing ball and then taking care of the, you know, all the marketing stuff, just helping me grow, grow my brand um, as an entity and helping me go out there and just opportunities and getting me out there and expo and that exposure is, is just great. It's just reassuring. And, you know, um, we kept everything very professional. That's one thing I really am, you know, excited about and proud about is it's not just for fun and games. Like this is a legit operation. This is like, hours of hours of meetings um you know concentration making sure we have everything on point like um making sure you know this is something that we really are passionate about and that that we really want to do and, it, and it's happening and it's working and to see it coming to fruition is definitely special so um just keeping it in-house and and having it grow to where it's going to become in, in the next couple of years is very very exciting and so speaking of it coming to fruition what does the vision look like for the next we'll say five years for sportsman like where do you guys vision it being in the next half decade we really see ourselves at the top in terms of rep representing um, local talent, um, Canadian talent. Um, I think, you know, we want to uh, be where, be a place where the top elite athletes, entertainers, um, um, storytellers, icons of the country could come here and really exploit themselves and really show themselves to the whole entire world and keep it at home. Um, I think, you know, we're going to be a company that um, guys are going to want to be, you know, associated with that. Hey, like, look at this. Like, I go out there. I'm on that. This is a company that that knows my story, that understands my story, that I can relate with. And it's not just, you know, an outsider thing. It's something that's that's close to home and to help us, you know, grow and, and have these opportunities, put me on these platforms. is something that's going to be very appealing to the masses. And, um, and once again, it's going back to the town that we have. We're very, very proud and confident of, of the town that is in the city um, and of this country. Like, it is crazy the amount of town that's present um, in Ottawa and, and in Canada. So to have that opportunity to keep it homegrown and not go down south with things is just special. And I think we're definitely going to be at the top of, in terms of representation uh, for, for athletes and entertainers across the country. 100%. And I like that you guys are starting in Ottawa. One, where it's your background, you know where it is too. And I don't know if you're familiar with Charlie Rocket. He used to manage two chains, did some stuff with Soldier Boy. And he's talked about, you can't boil the ocean, but you can boil a pot of water and you can keep boiling pots of water. And eventually you're boiling the ocean. You just got to do it one pot at a time. And that's what you guys are doing. You're starting with Ottawa where you know, and you guys are going to crush it there and boil that pot of water. And as you're going to expand, you're just going to keep adding to it. And I love that. And so my other question when it comes to sports, man, is like, what are what are all the things? So if I'm an athlete listening to this, why should I sign with Sportsman? Um, one of the main things, I think it's, it's family. I think it's a place where you could come and where guys are really, really tailored to what you're trying to do. Um, it's not a big, you know, mark, like big, crazy firm where there's a thousand of people, you know, working there. It's like very, very attention specific. And it's a place where um, I think, you know, you have the opportunity to just take care of yourself, like allow us to you know, handle the stuff that we need to handle where you could go out there and just worry about the main thing. And I think that allows players uh, or whatever, who you are to really exploit yourself, like to push yourself to the best of your abilities while not having to stress about the things behind the scenes. So I think those two things really are something that is, should be very appealing to anybody that's interested and really wants to go, you know, push themselves above and beyond and really put themselves out there. And, and correct this statement if I'm wrong, but with sportsmen, just being a startup essentially and it being a family you're going to get a more personalized service than if you're just another name on another spreadsheet for a giant agency um i believe so and i mean obviously we're going to grow throughout the years but you know to have that opportunity come, coming up right now like that's something that's that, that that was founded upon you know that that whole idea and that's a concept we're going to carry on for the rest of the attorney you know that's something that we're really prideful on and we're, we're really focusing on is just that whole family atmosphere like how we come about the foundation of it is something that you know we're definitely going to keep pushing throughout the throughout the year. So as much as we're going to grow, obviously we have plans and projects, but that's something that you always get to count on. It's like, hey, like this is a family oriented place that really, really appreciates the talent that we have in house in the country. Like it's very, very prideful, and that's something that you know you can't really take away or you can't really find anywhere else. And it's a representation. Like I mean, like if you think about it, like where else do you think like in Canada or is this happening at? Like people are always trying to go somewhere else. Like. Now, like this, this is our time. Sportsman is the place to be if you're a top, top, top elite person in, the, in, in Ottawa, in Canada, wherever else. Let's run it up. I love that. And I know we're over time. I respect your time. So I'm just going to jump to my last two questions that I have for you today. First one being, how often do you look back and reflect on the whole journey? Going all the way back to the, your early games with the generals, with that Oklahoma drill to moving away from Ottawa to going to UNC Rutgers now. Um, I know you've also been inducted into the Orleans Bengals Football Hall of Fame. Like You're starting this company now with, with your close friends that you grew up with. How often do you look back on everything and just think about how crazy the journey has been so far? 
it's funny you say that. Like just last night, we had one of those moments. Like one of my uh, James, one of the founders, he actually just moved right by the field of the East Auburn Generals that where we uh, started up. And we were just like, hey man, like remember that feeling? Like, we were just out there. Like we've come oh, such a long way, and we're actually just having that conversation, just prepping for everything that we have going on, and just like you know, sitting back and thinking, and just being grateful, thanking God. Like hey, like. This is where we have where we're at. This is what I've been able to, you know, accomplish throughout my life. And there's so much more ahead. And it's just exciting. But just always having those moments, you know. Um, it don't you don't ever really expect it to hit you, but when it hits you, it's always nice to fall back and just appreciate everything that's going on. And um, I'm a very blessed individual, man. Like I've said before, I have great people around my corner, I have great friends, great family members, a great support system. Um and my belief in God is something that I rely to. So um just being able to just, you know, look back, you know. I, I've been blessed and there's just so much more to go ahead that, you know, we're, I'm excited to see where we're going to take this whole thing at. I'm excited to see, to see you guys take it as well. And for my last question, I'd like to flip the script a little bit. So instead of me asking the question, it's you asking the question, but it's not to me. Pretend you have a crystal ball. You can ask this crystal ball any question. You'll get the 100% honest answer. What is one question you want to know the answer to? One question do I want to know the answer to? That's a good one right here. Um, hmm. Mm-hmm. Ah, I would say two questions pop to mind. One, does pineapple really belong on pizza? Or two, who is better, LeBron James or Michael Jordan? And I feel, I feel like if I were to, if we were to come up with two definitive answers to those questions, it would solve a lot of problems in the world. So I'm surprised that no one has ever asked if pineapple belongs on pizza yet. I've been doing this podcast. Like I said, this is the 150th interview on the show. No one's ever asked that question, which I think is super interesting that this finally happened now. And two, I think, I don't even know. I think that crystal ball would break if you asked that LeBron Jordan we question. Need, we need an answer. See, that's okay. <laughs> See, we need an answer because it would just, all the barbershop talks, like I think it would save a couple wars if we had an official answer on who was the greatest basketball player of all time. I think that's the real answer. And for the record, for people listening, it's LeBron James. If we're throwing it out there, it's LeBron. I'm just saying. I think I'd have to agree with you on that. But um, my friend, I want to thank you so much for taking time to be on this podcast. I want to give you the floor. Where can the people find you? Where can the people find Sportsman? Plug anything and everything you got right now. Yeah, so you can find me at Patrice Rene, um, underscore on all my social media. And Sportsman, you can find us everywhere as well. We're on Twitter, um, you know, Instagram, um, find me on YouTube, TikTok at Sportsman, um, Inc. Inc. So the way we spell Sportsman, S P O R T S M X N, um, just to clarify for people. And this is our logo right here that you guys can definitely see. Um, and the reason behind the X, just to explain it, is just, you know, we're an inclusive company. You know, we're not just sportsmen, but sportsmen in the sense that we're inclusive to every everybody, men, women, um, and whatever age, color, whatever that is, you know, it does it isn't defined by anything, which is the representation seen through the X. So um, you can definitely find us on all those platforms. And, you know, we're excited to, you know, get this ball rolling and for, see, for you guys to see our projects and what we have going on. And like I said, man, we're going to the top and uh, this is a very exciting time for everybody involved. And um, it's going to be very special. So I appreciate you, Jacob, for having me on here. It's been a blast talking to you, man. And I appreciate every moment of it. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, dude. Now, I will say I love that. I didn't know that about the X in the name of Sportsman, and I absolutely love the reason behind that. And I'll make sure everything's linked in the show notes down below so that people can find it. Thank you once again for taking time to be on the podcast, man. I want to thank everybody for listening, whether you've listened the entire way through or you only listen to bits and pieces. I really appreciate it. Take time to check this out. Everyone do me a big favor. Go and follow Patrice. Go and follow Sportsman. Like I said, everything will be linked in the show notes down below so you can find it. If you'd like to follow me, you can find me everywhere on social media at Jacob Kelly. Feel free to come and say hello. My DMs are always open. As always, today's podcast is powered by true fan thank you once again for listening everybody we'll talk soon